there. Remember Yi Gun? Dr. Lee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's there. That's good. Hi, Lee. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Good evening for a lot of people who are joining from different parts of the country. Welcome to the 65th International Weekly Meeting on COVID in association with Samao. Uh, today, 3rd of July, we have a very important topic. Uh, we are talking about COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, to present this topic, we have none other than Dr. Monica Vasudev. Uh, I would like to introduce her before she can take over. Dr. Monica Vasudev is an allergist uh, and a clinical immunologist who is from who is a fellow of American Academy of Asthma, Allergy and Immunology and American College of uh, Allergic Asthma and Immunology. She graduated with a business, uh, bachelor's degree in science biochemistry from McMaster University in Canada. She then pursued her medical degree from Ramaya College in Bangalore. During that time, she also contributed for assistant uh, editor and writer in Indian Journal of Clinical Practices. She completed her residency in internal medicine, uh, followed by the fellowship in allergy and uh, clinical immunology from the Medical College of Wisconsin, where she continued to be the faculty of her five years and got promoted. During that time, she got medic, uh, program uh, director in of the infusion center, who was chosen as a subject matter expert. She's an author for four chapters in the book, 12 publications and 37 publications. She is currently an advocate for uh, Euro Health in, for the past eight years. Over to you, Dr. Monica, for presenting the topic. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, I was wondering if you could um, allow me to screen share. Yes, you can. Uh, so today's topic is on COVID-19 vaccines, and I believe that this topic can be presented every day because the landscape of information is changing so rapidly, um, and it affects uh, the way we treat um, our response to the pandemic. Um, and we're really looking for a path to a post-pandemic world, um, and some places are there closer and others are not, but we're always facing the, the threat of losing that post-pandemic um, uh, uh, time uh, with uh, new variants. So um, I'd like to see a future with, uh, with uh, getting away from this. And I see that the vaccines is our ticket to do so. So um, what you are seeing um, is the burden of this pandemic um, as of July 2nd um, on the world. We have uh, over almost 200 million cases with uh, up to uh, 4 million deaths. Um, and you have seen the recovery of 170 million people. And that recovery does not mean recovery, just you're fine, you move forward. There has been a significant burden of morbidity on these patients, whether it be people who've lost wage time, um, been isolated from their lives, or who continue to uh, experience symptoms as they uh, continue to recover from um, the vaccine, uh, from the, sorry, the infection. And we've all heard of cases and other meetings about people who continue to have anosmia, or we've heard about brain fog. Um, so even though we've got this recovered uh, situation here, uh, that does not necessarily reflect uh, the, true, the true burden of disease. So to talk about um, infection and vaccination, um, I would like to talk about uh, the immune responses. And this is always something that um, I think is just so, um, so short lived, so transient in our mind, but it's always good to remember because a lot of these words and concepts are being used to explain uh, the vaccine and the infection immunity. So what do we talk about when I'm gonna first talk about just general immunity, general immunity to infections, and then we'll talk about vaccines later. So uh, what is the immune response to viral infections? So our immune system is the body's natural de uh, defense uh, to uh, pathogens and to resist infections. Uh, there's two types of immunity. We have the innate and we have the adaptive immunity. 
you're in the immunity, and I consider the immunity like uh, the defense of um, an army. That's your first line. You're quick, your first line. They recognize that there is an enemy and they are attacking. It is an immediate response to any infection. They are the innate immune response cells. They secrete interferons, which are a type of hormone that help kill and destroy the infection and other chemicals such as cytokines. They interfere with viral replication. And it is this innate response, that first line of defense that actually act activates the adaptive immune response. And I think of the adaptive review, uh, immune response as the kind of sophisticated, holding back a little bit, waiting to see what the innate system is doing, and then being given the signal that now I need to get pulled in because I need something that's stronger and a little bit more sophisticated to treat this infection. This is the second line of defense. It's a specific response to the infection, and that's what's key here. It is defense against a very specific pathogen. It starts uh, days later, six to eight days later, and it involves two types of white blood cells called the T cells, which is your cellular response, and your B cell, which is your antibody response. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail. So what is our immune response to viral infections? I love this graphic to give us a timeline as to what we are seeing. So the shaded blue here represents when you are having symptoms. It's not clear. It can start earlier for some, later for other. What you're seeing here is the beginning of the innate response in this short, humped, light blue line that starts at the beginning. The virus is detectable soon after, and you can see that it replicates quickly, and then it dissipates while it's in that phase, though we now have the activation first of the cellular response, and then you start seeing the two tiers of the antibodies. At day eight, you're starting to see the early antibody response, which is your IgM antibody. And then you have your late antibody response, which is your IgG. So what are we seeing with our um, immune response in terms of this sophisticated second line adaptive immunity? Um, and that is both the humoral immunity which is on the left here, and then the cell-mediated immunity on the right that represents these two columns. So looking at this schema, we're seeing the microbe, which is the infection, and humoral immunity are your extracellular microbes. The responding lymphocyte is your B lymphocyte, and its effector mechanism is secreting the antibodies. So humoral immunity is defined by B cells producing antibodies that's specific to an extracellular microbe. And these prevent infections and eliminate extracellular um, eye microbes. You then have cell-mediated immunity arm that, that can also be extracellular microbes that can be phagocytosed, like within macrophages, or you have the intracellular microbes such as viruses, and you have the responding lymphocytes, which are your T lymphocytes. Now, general, in general, T lymphocytes are defined by the cytokines that they produce. Um, you have your helper T cells, you have your cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And what you see with the helper T cells is that you get activation of neutrophils that can um, then kill the micro microbes or you have the direct lysis of the infected cells by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. So a little bit more detail. Um, I promise it's not too much immunology here. Um, the lymphocytes are you have B lymphocytes, the helper T lymphocytes, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And then I wanted to make um, a word about T regulatory lymphocytes. What you see here on the left is that you have antigen recognition. So you have your microbe, you have your B lymphocyte with its cell surface receptors, it's identifying the microbe. It then causes the proliferation um, of um, other immune cells and causing neutralization of the microbe, the phagocytosis, and the complement activation where these antibodies actually recognize the microbe and then create all these effector functions. You have the helper T lymphocytes, um, you have um, the infected cell with this MHC class restriction, activating this T lymphocyte that then secretes specific cytokines that defines a T lymphocyte that's a helper T lymphocyte. It then does a lot of help, right? It's called the helper T lymphocyte, it's activating macrophages, it's causing inflammation, it's causing proliferation, differentiation of T and B lymphocytes. You then have the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These are the very strong, very active. They actually directly kill the infected cell. Um, and then you have the last arm, which is your T regulatory lymphocyte, where it's kind of regulating and dampening down the um, immune system. I kind of see its role in autoimmune diseases, 
trying to make sure that we're not having uncontrolled, unregulated immune system. And you're just trying to suppress other lymphocytes. So in the SARS-CoV-2 infection, both virus-specific But you have both the B cell humoral immunity and you have the T cell immunity, which have been implicated in um, recovered COVID patients. And that's really important to know because I think everybody is measuring the immunity to either infection or vaccination by just one specific arm of the immune system, and that's a B lymphocyte. So we can't forget that there are other parts of the immune system that are being activated. So what is it that's part of the virus that we're targeting in terms of natural immunity or through vaccination? So what you see here is a uh, diagram of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. You see that there are multiple proteins involved on the cell surface. You have the membrane glycoprotein designated M, the nucleocapsid protein N, you have the envelope protein E, you have the RNA that's in the center of the capsid, and then you have the spike protein. The spike protein is what has been implicated um, in terms of being an effective target to neutralize uh, by um, infection and by vaccination uh, to help uh, contain uh, the infection. And what we see is that if there are antibodies that are developed against uh, the non-spike protein, that they may not be as effective in, um, in uh, neutralizing the virus. So when we're measuring antibodies, are we measuring antibodies to the spike protein? Are we measuring antibodies to other parts? So again, another layer of complexity of understanding immune responses. So this is the spike protein. This is a trimeric protein, which comprises of an S1 subunit that binds to the host cell, an S2 subunit that's responsible for membrane fusion, um, and then the S1 subunit is one that contains this N-terminal domain and the receptor binding domain. And you're gonna hear this or see this in your uh, review of articles related to immunity, especially vaccine immunity, you might be seeing RBD. And this represents the spike right here, the spike of the spike. So the um, spike protein is like an umbrella where this part um, of this um, is like the tip of the canopy. And this is the one that's responsible for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, virus um, entering uh, the cells. And what we know is that 40% uh, of the circulating antibodies um, can um, target uh, the S2 antibody here, but we also know that sometimes up to 84% of the antibodies that are seen from natural infection are actually targeting the receptor binding domain. So I've talked about different parts of the immune system. They're all being activated. We're saying that when we're looking at antibody production to the spike protein, that there's different parts of the spike protein and not all antibodies are created equal. Um, so there is a variability in terms of how we are responding. And this is exactly what was shown in this study. So this is looking at those individuals who have the infection not they're not people who've been vaccinated. So these are people who've been infected. And they looked at four different components of the immune uh, response to the infection. They looked at antigen-specific antibodies, looking at the spike protein and the receptor binding domain. And you can see that in the orange over here. You have your memory B cells. Now, memory B cells are called memory B cells because they have memory of De uh, developing antibodies to a very specific, what we call epitope or uh, designated area of an antigen. You have your CD4 helper T cells and you have your cytotoxic T cells. And what you can see is that every combination and permutation of, of immune responses are being designated by a different colored uh, circle or a dot. And these represent every combination of, um, of responses. On the left panel here, you are seeing what the immune response is in individuals one month after infection. You're seeing that the immune responses are variable. Um, and then what you're seeing at six months is that you are seeing that there is a shift away from full immunity. You're losing some immunity, but not all immunity. And again, there is variation in the immune responses from different individuals. And again, this is not just looking um, at antibodies. So there was a comment about measuring antibodies, and this is a very common theme that's appearing in our, um, in our conversations week after week. 
Um, so what are we doing? What we know is that antibodies, like I'd shown you in the viral immune response, that they can appear later, and the antibodies in this case can appear one to three weeks after symptoms appear. We know that the immune response can differ in intensity between those who are asymptomatic versus those who are symptomatic. So that person who is screened for COVID before they go in for an elective procedure and is SARS-CoV-2 positive is going to have a very different immune response profile than the person who is admitted in the ICU with disease. So those with more severe disease appear to have a higher level of neutralizing antibodies. It is unclear the usefulness of monitoring uh, responses as a measure of the presence and duration of immunities to SARS-CoV-2. You're only looking at one piece of the puzzle when you're monitoring antibody levels. So there should be no joy and there should be no grief based on these results. We know that antibodies can dissipate, lasting no more than 10 months. And we know that T cells and possibly memory B cells have the capacity to recall and initiate sterilizing immune responses. So a little word about the T cell responses. So those with low level neutralizing antibodies, I got my vaccine, I got infected, I checked my antibody levels, but I'm not immune. That may not be the case. So what we're seeing here is that the innate and the T cell response may clear the virus. So people who were exposed to the COVID-2, SARS-CoV-2 virus may develop specific T cell responses without detectable antibodies. And that mild um, SARS-CoV-2 infections or asymptomatic can generate memory T cell responses that can prevent recurrent infections. And this is diagrammed um, in this really uh, small uh, box in the bottom right-hand corner, where the blue line represents the antibodies and what you're seeing is the T, uh, T cells represented in the red. The left is the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, response. And so what we're seeing is that there's a divergence between the T cell response um, and the antibodies. And you can see that, um, that um, reference right there. So moving away from the basic immunology now is what are we doing? How are we gonna get move past forward from this pandemic? And we really think that proverbial light at the end of the tunnel is going to be through um, our vaccines. So what are we looking for with um, an efficacious COVID-19 vaccine? So we have someone who's exposed to the infection. Our desire is, can we prevent infection? Um, if they do get infected, make sure that they remain asymptomatic so that they're not coughing, they're not spreading droplets. If they are infected, how can we prevent disease? If they develop disease, how can we develop parameters so they prevent hospital um, admission, prevent critical care needs, and obviously prevent death and then subsequent uh, transmission? Um, and we just saw what the local surge of uh, the infection has done to certain areas, whether it be Italy, whether it be Brazil, whether it be India, uh, that we have seen the uh, massive utilization of healthcare uh, resources beyond the ability to provide it um, and how it has affected uh, care. So really we are using the vaccination to flatten that curve. Now, um, we have seen an unprecedented uh, pandemic and we have seen an unprecedented response to the pandemic. Let's look and compare the development of the COVID vaccine uh, with what we have seen um, in the past. Uh, of the more relatively recent viral diseases, we have HIV. We have still, um, research is ongoing for this vaccine. It's still been 32 years in development. Compared to one year of the COVID-19, 2020, 2021, which utilized all the, um, all the new developments and research um, and tools that we had uh, to maximize and optimize the development of this vaccine. Look at how long it has taken, 105 years for typhoid, 47 years for polio. I just really like this graphic to really illustrate that we have seen something truly unprecedented um, um, in our lifetimes beyond the actual pandemic, but its response to it. And then I thought it would be nice to just share this um, uh, kind of timeline of things that have been uh, seen, at least on the American side, in terms of uh, our vaccines of the Moderna and the New England Journal, and you are just seeing just months in between uh, events to, that led to the illness being documented, the virus being sequenced, um, and then we get extra um, emergency use authorization 
uh, for the utilization, and then the actual administration of healthcare professionals, all within within the same year. So our vaccine um, design and clinical trials began immediately after uh, the COVID pandemic began. We benefited from the rapid sequencing um, of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, and we did realize that the spike protein was a key target for the immune system relatively early um, in this uh, pandemic. And what I'm showing you here is the key um, release of the actual genome, and this was released on the 10th of January in 2020. Uh, and what you're seeing here is that um, uh, the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center and School of Public Health, in collaboration with the Central Hospital of Wuhan, um, the Wazong University of Science and Technology, the Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institute of Communicable Disease Control and Prevention, the Chinese Center for Disease Control, and the University of Sydney, Australia, uh, releasing the um, coronavirus genome from a case of the respiratory disease. That is incredible collaboration, and that is an incredible timeline. Uh, I thought this was a really uh, cool thing to share um, in terms of where we are in this pandemic. And now I know that talking about each individual vaccine, the science that goes behind it, um, it's its own um, separate presentation, but I thought this was a nice graphic to kind of summarize the different uh, types of uh, vaccines that we have, the manufacturers of uh, these vaccines um, as, um, as a summary. So the two biggest players that we have are the mRNA vaccines, which introduced the mRNA vaccine into, um, into the body. It's recognized, it produces the uh, spike protein to trigger an immune response, you have Pfizer, Moderna, and then you have your viral vector uh, vaccine, which is your AstraZeneca, your Johnson & Johnson, and they insert the gene for a viral protein into another harmless virus, um, and then it then causes the immune response. I'd like to also draw your attention to the subunit vaccine, which is Novavax, because there's been some news uh, that um, has been released this week or uh, recently uh, regarding uh, the excellent uh, outcomes from this vaccine. So this is definitely one that we that is on our radar, and that's the Novavax. So going back to, uh, to the spike protein, uh, what I'm showing you here um, is that uh, there are two forms going into a little bit more detail about the spike protein you have what's known as the pre-fusion spike protein, which is this triangular purple um, uh, uh, self-surface uh, protein versus the post-fusion spike, which is more um, of this uh, columnar uh, form. And we know that both forms of the spike protein um, can be found on the surface and, um, and, uh, doesn't, and it can be found in that form even without binding to the ACE2 receptor on the host. And it's really interesting that they found that there was a proline substitution um, in, the, uh, uh, in the spike protein that stabilized it in its pre-fusion spike form, which would then allowed uh, the development of these uh, vaccines. And um, I'm not showing you that diagram today, but I wanted to share that piece of the history of the development um, of the vaccine. This is just a quick diagram to show you that you have the mRNA, it's in a lipid nanoparticle, containing um, uh, uh, a particle. It is then taken up by the host cell. The mRNA is released, it utilizes the host ribosome, produces a spike protein that's then released and then elicits the immune response versus the viral vector vaccines um, and the adenovirus or the non-replicating viral vectors are the ones that are currently used for the COVID vaccine where the coronavirus spike uh, protein is introduced. Um, and it is then injected, it's taken up by your antigen product, um, presenting cells, MHC class restri uh, restriction um, ends up uh, causing um, cell mediated um, immunity. So um, going on to the next uh, topic, and now this is uh, looking at, well, how effective um, are these vaccines? And there is an incredible amount of data that has been released and looking at the efficacy of these vaccines in certain populations. Um, I'm just showing you a few. They're not by all means representative of all the data that's out there. So this is a, um, a data set from, um, from Israel. Um, and what they did, uh, this uh, paper was published on April 15th, um, and it looked at individuals who were vaccinated between December 20th um, and February 1st. And what you can see is an incredible uh, equal number of 596,618 
subjects in both the unvaccinated arm and in the vaccinated arm. And then they're looking at the efficacy in terms of documented SARS-CoV-2 infections, symptomatic COVID-19, COVID-19 hospitalization, severe COVID-19 or death uh, with uh, respect to time after vaccination. And they looked at seven days um, after the um, second dose. And then they looked at a two time period, which was days 14 to 20, and then again, days 21 to 27, uh, representing is there immunity like after the first dose and right before the second dose. And what I think is extremely um, impressive um, is that they found that the estimated vaccine efficacy during the follow-up period, starting seven days after the second dose, was 92% for documented infection um, and was 94% for symptomatic uh, COVID-19, 87% um, for hospitalization, um, and 92% for uh, severe COVID-19. This is incredible. Um, when we look at the seasonal influenza vaccine, and um, when we look at it in our winter season, when we have a vaccine efficacy of 50%, we're, we're happy. Um, the Sputnik vaccine is another um, viral vector vaccine. And this was a um, news a report that was released. Um, um, I couldn't find the primary uh, data for this. And with this, uh, with this report, it said that there were 3.8 million Russians who were vaccinated uh, with both components of the Sputnik uh, 5 vaccine. Um, this was done through a mass vaccination program. These were people who were vaccinated from the 5th of December to the 31st of March. Um, and that they foresaw that the infection rate starting from the 35th day from the first day of the infection was only 0.027%. And the incidence among the unvaccinated population was 1.1% during that comparable period. Uh, why this is important is that Sputnik is uh, approved for use in 60 countries with a total population of 3 billion people. It ranks second among coronavirus vaccines globally in terms of the number of approvals um, issued by uh, global um, by uh, government uh, regulators. Um, and this was released by the Gamalaya National Research Center of Epidemiology and micro, uh, Microbiology in uh, Moscow. So now let's look at the efficacy in terms of extremes of age. So there was a UK study that looked at the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, and the Os Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccines in those who were 70 and older. And what they found here, as you can see um, in the graphic summary of their, um, uh, of their uh, publication or their visual abstract, that it was 80% um, effective uh, in preventing COVID-19 uh, related uh, hospitalizations. So I think this is uh, why there was such a push to vaccinate those that were in um, elderly care um, early in the uh, pandemic. Um, and this was the basis uh, for the immunization of the Pfizer vaccine in ages uh, 12 to 15 that just opened up uh, last month. Um, and so this was uh, the study that was published May 27th in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it looked at the safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine in adolescents, um, and they showed um, um, great uh, protection, um, and uh, we are now immunizing our adolescents. So what is the state of immunization status in the world? And this is data as of July 1st. Uh, what you're seeing here um, is a map of the world and that the darker the shade of the blue, uh, you are uh, now seeing um, those people who have at least received one dose of the immunization. Canada has done extremely well. Uh, they did not have um, significant doses at the beginning of the pandemic. They had Moderna and Pfizer, AstraZeneca became available in Canada, which is not available in the United States. Um, they then increased the time duration to 16 weeks after the first dose of their general non-healthcare provider population. And then all of a sudden they received an influx of doses in the last month where those who were given vaccination times of 16 weeks after their first dose were now able to get it within four to six weeks of their second of, the, of their first dose. And this is what you're seeing now. Um, if you do trend back and see a few bit weeks back that um, there was not that level of darkness in the hue. So it is possible looking at Canada's example to be able to vaccinate very quickly based on the availability of vaccines and creating um, 
outreach and vaccination and um, advertising programs to make sure that it is reaching to your population. Okay, I do want to spend um, a, a minute talking about antibody dependent enhancement. And this is a function that is seen with um, immunization. And, and this was a question that has been asked of me um, several times um, of the past. And what this is, is that when you have antibodies that both bind to the um, viral particles, but also to the FC portion um, uh, or the gamma receptors that are expressed on immune cells. So it's like, you know, your antibodies binding to the virus, and then this antibody has kind of a, a docket that it can land on on top of a cell. And then the virus is then um, internalized. And then it produces antibodies, and those antibodies are not neutralizing antibodies, um, and then they um, actually cause more damage. Um, this is called, uh, there's something known as the Trojan horse pathway. This occurs when you have non-neutralizing antibodies that are generated by past vaccination uh, to shut down the pathogen um, on, um, on uh, re-exposure. And what they do is that they, um, uh, lead to a wider dissemination of the illness um, and uh, it causes more harm um, than good. What we do know about this antibody dependent enhancement is that we have not seen this with the vaccinations. We have not seen this with infections. We have seen this classically with dengue. And we also know that if you have high levels of neutralizing antibodies that help bring down this uh, interaction right here, you are going to be able to uh, prevent uh, this from um, happening. So I do, I do not think that this is a current issue related to this current vaccine. It is an immune phenomenon um, that we um, have seen. Um, okay, so I'd like to now talk about uh, the biggest issue that we have. And the biggest issue, the need of the hour, is uh, that we now have a variant um, that is quicker to infect, causes more severe disease, um, and has the ability to shut down that dream of a post-pandemic world. I just feel that this is something that is telling us that we need to really step up all our efforts in terms of educating others about the vaccine the safety about the vaccine, ensuring the vaccines are going where they need to do, uh, where they need to go, I'm sorry, um, and to make sure that we're doing it fast enough because I feel like this is why we're short of time and that is because of this Delta variant. Um, so this right here is showing uh, the results of 25 subjects um, and it was a study that was posted on uh, May 10th. And these are people who received both shots of Moderna um, and Pfizer vaccine um, and who were able to produce enough antibodies to be able to neutralize uh, the Delta variant. So this was from May 10th. And then what you can see here, um, this is a study that was, um, that was released on May 28th. Um, and this was uh, from the um, uh, preprint manuscript that's online where both uh, the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine showed efficacy against uh, symptomatic disease from the Delta variant. So they found that there were two doses of the Pfizer was 88% effective towards uh, Delta. Um, and they also found that there was 93 uh, effective against the Alpha British variant. And after one dose that there was 33% efficacy against the Delta and 50% against the Epica, uh, Alpha efficacy against the alpha. So this is the, uh, vir uh, the vaccines of Pfizer and AstraZeneca, and they're showing that there is some um, effectiveness against the Delta uh, variant. Okay, um, and this is just uh, that same study again, uh, showing you um, a little bit more. Um, oh no, the, sorry, this was uh, the June uh, 23rd uh, study showing also that there are um, antibodies um, from vaccination that help prevent, um, prevent um, entry of the um, Delta variant. So what about um, 
what about uh, other immune um, responses that we are seeing? So the germinal center um, are like tiny factories that make antibodies that produce, um, or that make antibody producing uh, B cells. Um, and these are typically found after immunization. Um, and then they can last for a few weeks. So the longer these germinal centers exist, uh, the longer and stronger your immunity is going to be uh, to the vaccinations. So in this study, they looked at germinal centers from axillary lymph nodes of 14 recipients of the Pfizer vaccine. And three weeks um, after the dose, uh, they found that these germinal centers were making B cells. And then after the second dose, that, that, uh, that expansion um, and the amount of uh, B cell production was markedly um, increased. And we, they saw that this was also true for the Moderna vaccine as well. So here you're seeing histopath for corroboration of the uh, immune response uh, to, uh, the, um, to the immunizations. And this is, this is data from last week. This was published on June 28th. Okay, so now let's talk about hybrid immunity. So one of the things that I have to address when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, and I've even had patients who are physicians who said to me, you know what, I had COVID in October, I had COVID in November, I don't need the vaccine because I'm immune. And so earlier in the presentation, I had shown you that there, one part of the immune response is antibodies and you might be developing antibodies to the non-receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So those antibodies may not be so effective, but uh, you also have cell mediated immunity as well. Um, so what happens when you have an infection and then you get um, immunization? This is called um, hybrid immunity. So natural immunity with symptomatic COVID infection has shown to be effective, but we effective, but variants of concern uh, that uh, can also reduce um, our uh, immune response in general uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, this immune response. So vaccines, as I just shown you, has shown that they can, they can mount an immune response to the variants, such as the Delta variant. In those individuals who have received uh, the vaccination and who have been previously immunized, they actually develop a stronger than expected um, immune response. And this involves all the aspects of immunity, whether it be memory B cells, antibody, CD4 and CDT, uh, CD8 T cells um, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the um, infection. So therefore what, you're showing, what we're seeing is that the hybrid uh, vigor immunity um, occurs with uh, vaccination following a natural immunity. Um, neutralizing antibodies against the beta uh, strain of a vaccination of individuals who are infected with non-beta were 100 times more uh, than infection alone uh, compared to uh, 25 times more than um, vaccination alone. So again, what you're seeing is that your natural immunity is low, vaccine immunity is a little bit better, but if you have both, then you've got the best of both worlds. And then this is where that diagram is coming from. This is coming from um, a publication uh, that you can see uh, here, um, and what you're seeing is that there is an increase um, in variant neutralizing antibodies after vaccination, after previously infected SARS-CoV-2 infected uh, persons reflecting a recall of diverse and high quality memory B cells that are generated after the original infection. So I just showed you about the germinal centers with the B cells and that they're long lasting. And now I'm showing you that hybrid immunity is also fantastic. So to all those patients who have, or individuals who've had infection, this is really good for them uh, to receive the immunization as well. So this is another, um, another uh, topic that has been in the news and that's about mixing um, and matching vaccines. That's been given a specific term. It's called heterologous uh, prime and boost. Um, uh, and it's, uh, this trial is called the COMCOV. That's the one um, out of UK. And what they did was they tried to assess the immune responses in patients who've been given heterologous prime boost vaccine schedules using the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. And what they found was that it led to a higher reactogenicity, um, but it also had some more common side effects uh, such as uh, fever. And then 
Uh, this was the report that they posted on, on June 25th. This was the preprint in the Lancet. Uh, they had the AstraZeneca, the four weeks later they had the Pfizer, and they had increased antibodies uh, to the spike proteins, and that it was higher than those who had received uh, two doses of the AstraZeneca. This is the Comavax trial. Um, this was the Spanish trial, um, uh, the Oxford uh, followed by the Pfizer, um, and this included 663 people. And what you're seeing here is the intervention group in the orange um, boxes. You have the control group in the blue boxes. So uh, those uh, who received two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine are in blue. Those who received the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer are in orange. And what you're seeing is seven days and 14 days after vaccination. And again, this is the log titers that you are having much higher values in those who received uh, the mix and match versus two of the same. Um, and that's what they're doing in Canada right now is that uh, they're offering any dose of, uh, of any second vaccine. So I alluded earlier to this about keeping our, um, uh, our ears to the ground regarding Novavax. Um, and so this uses a protein of SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's a different technology uh, from the COVID vaccines that we have so far. It does utilize um, familiar technology that's been used for hepatitis B um, and the pertussis vaccine. And these vaccines are two doses um, that are given uh, three weeks apart. Um, this has been um, uh, in use since uh, 1986 um, in the United States in the, um, in the, pertuss, um, in the pertussis vaccine. Um, and we also have um, what we see is actually a 90.4% overall efficacy against symptomatic uh, COVID infections. Um, and they found 100% efficacy um, against uh, moderate to severe infections. Against eight viral uh, uh, strains of interest and concern, the efficacy was 93.2%. Uh, and the vaccine was considered to be very safe um, and well tolerated. And unlike the mRNA vaccines, it does not need to be stored frozen. Um, it can be stored in the refrigerator up to six months, and it's viable for 24 hours on the counter. So now you have the, uh, a vaccine that's efficacious, and you also have the ability for it to be pragmatic in terms of worldwide uh, distribution and does not require a freezer space. Um, and this was the actual publication from that Novavax uh, trial uh, that was just uh, released recently. Um, and you can see that there were what the number of participants, how many sites uh, were found in the United States um, and Mexico, um, and that uh, how what was the, um, the socio demographic um, breakup of the, uh, the subjects that were included. What you're seeing in the blue bar here are the, uh, the talking points related uh, to the efficacy of, of these. Um, uh, uh, of this particular vaccine, um, and that uh, it did have the high level um, levels of efficacy. Um, so um, they're going to send more data. Um, I do believe that this is one vaccine that we, we should be uh, following um, because I do think that this is very, very good news, especially in addressing you know, efficacy, safety, storage, addressing variants of concern, um, I, I, I think that, uh, that this is addressing a lot of the issues that we're facing. So what are we thinking about in the future? Um, this is what the typical US vaccination uh, card looks like. Uh, they write our name in, they put in our product and manufactured lot number and the date it was administered and then they have like a free digital code or something that they use for the healthcare site. And normally it's just listing the two doses. When are we expecting that third dose? Is that third dose gonna be different? Is it gonna be a booster dose uh, this fall? Are they gonna change the um, uh, sequencing in the mRNA vaccines to represent the variants? All of this is actually being studied right now, but what actually manifests to um, in what's gonna actually be the jab in your arm is what we have to wait and see what will happen. And then I wanna just make one comment um, about vaccines and the approach to vaccines. I mean, this is so, antiquated, we, we know this. So this is in 1802, and the Brit British satirist James Gilray, he characterized the scene of such smallpox inoculation at the hospital at St. Pancras, and he's showing Edward Jenner administering the cowpox vaccine to frighten young women 
And because of the fear of the vaccine, they're showing that there are cows that are emerging from different parts of people's bodies. I feel like I face the same attitude and thought process related to vaccines from my patients when it comes to the current vaccines available, even though they've been administered to millions of people, but we really have to do our work to understand uh, the vaccine hesitancy that is existing to be able to capture those people when vaccines are available to um, find that post-pandemic world. Um, and then um, just talking about, the, again, the safety, um, we did, there were a lot of initial reports of anaphylaxis, which I think has been uh, discussed and not an issue anymore. Uh, that's related to the polysorbate 80 or the polyethylene glycol, ubiquitous components that um, is really not panning out in terms of understanding why some people are developing um, anaphylaxis or anaphylaxis-like um, presentations. The issue of the cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombosis associated with thrombocytopenia with the vector-based uh, vaccines, and then the myocarditis that we're seeing with the young adolescent boys uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. But again, the numbers related to the safety uh, are with regards to these vaccines. When I discuss it with my patients, I ask them if they've smoked or if they've been on oral contraceptives, and then I don't discuss it any further. Um, we all got the jab, or we all should encourage others. So we set by example. So I know that's a lot of my colleagues have expressed concerns related to vaccination. So it's all about um, uh, information. And then I'd like to uh, dedicate my continued learning uh, to Dr. KK Agarwal, who was a true hero who healed and who continues to heal today because everything I said today was motivated by him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica, and a wonderful presentation. And yes, uh, a dream which was started by Dr. KK Agarwal, uh, bringing a platform for learning for everyone. The legacy has been continued, and uh, today he should be very happy to see 45 international participants on one row. Uh, thanks to Mr. Chong for helping me out for bringing all those people. I sent one form to everyone. Uh, basically who wants some like whoever wants the transcript of this uh, presentation and the videos and the links can form, sign up the form and we will send you an email in a couple of days and uh, uh, so thank you dr monica and quickly i would like so there are a lot of people today so i would not be able to acknowledge everyone but quickly i would like to acknowledge all the uh, medical associations which are present over here, uh, starting with Mr. Chong from Singapore Medical Association, Mr. Ravi from Malaysian Medical Association, uh, Professor Ashra from uh, Pakistan Medical Association, uh, uh, Mr. Elvin from Hong Kong Medical Association, Mr. Pillay from in, in, uh, World Medical Council, Dr. Salma from Pakistan Medical Association, Dr. Angelica from South African Medical Association, from uh, Dr. Jamal Chaudhary from Bangladesh Medical Association, Dr. Akhtar Hussain from South Africa Medical Association, Dr. Mukti from Nepal Medical Association, Dr. Subramaniam from Malaysian Medical Association again, Dr. Uh, uh, Sajad from Pakistan Medical Association, Dr. Deborah from Brazil, Dr. Mary from Japan, and then we have Dr. Shashank Joshi, Dr. Russell from uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, Dr. Monica, the presenter, Dr. Nidhi from US, Dr. Sanchita from IGCP Group, Dr. Minakshi from Artke Foundation, and myself, Sarabh Agarwal. So uh, we, we have uh, still about 15, 20 minutes we can cover up. Dr. Chong, would you like to take it forward? Thank you, Sarabh. And uh, thank you, Monica, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Really a good summary. Uh, before I throw the questions open to the floor, I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, we have a test now in Singapore called the C-plus technology. We can look at it neutralizing antibodies to the, uh, to the receptor binding domain of the spike uh, protein. Uh, what are your thoughts on using C-plus for, let's say, for, for myself and for my patients to assess if I um, you know, am, am adequately covered by my vaccines? So that's a great question. So this is a this is a huge issue, right? We we are vaccinated, we are sick. Did we are we protected? Are we going to continue to live in fear, or are we going to say that we've had some level of protection? 
Now, developing antibodies and being able to detect neutralizing antibodies to the receptor binding domain is very difficult. But if it is present, I do feel that you are looking at the physiologically important component uh, that can help with immunity. But do I think that that's the whole picture? No. So if I have a patient with common variable immune deficiency and they don't make antibodies, they're on immunoglobulin replacement therapy that doesn't contain any of the antibody levels, I'm going to tell my patient to get um, vaccinated and I'm going to think that their memory, you know, T cells or other immune aspects are going to be generated. But that doesn't mean that their immunity assessment is any, is, is any, um, is it? <clears throat> we're just thinking that there's going to oh, be immunity. Yeah. I don't know what the correlation of antibodies to that RBD level is going to pre uh, prevent against infection. There are reports out there under the research guidance, but you have to validate the tests that you have, right? And then you have to validate when was the test done with respect to when immunization occurred and whether or not they had a natural infection too. So I think it's it's partly good, but do I think that it's going to give you any more information? Vaccination plus social distancing guidelines, depending on the community spread level, it's more important than getting a blood test. Thank you, uh, Monica. There's also one more question I'd like to ask before I throw it open to the floor. And that is, you know, I've had uh, two Pfizer vaccines and a lot of people here have two AstraZeneca's and so on. So everybody's now looking at, or two Sinovacs, uh, you know. So everybody's now looking at um, the, the booster shot being something different. Uh, you know, for example, uh, 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 Pfizer and then do an AstraZeneca or a Sinovac, do a Pfizer later on. What are your thoughts on this, um, um, you know, mixing and matching of the booster shot versus the original vaccination? Thank you. So that, that's a great question. And I think with the data that we just got with the mixing and matching that we've seen, my feeling is that you should get a different vaccine for your booster shot. Yes, very clearly. And I, it would probably be like mRNA versus viral vector, viral vector versus protein subunit. And that's what makes Novavax very interesting because it's using technology that's different than any vaccine we have. So that has the ability to be available to the entire country. And they say, you know what, you guys, it doesn't matter what you've received before, we can all get Novavax now and that can be our booster shot utilizing a different technology. But yes, knowing what I know today, had I had the opportunity to go through the immunization again, I would have mixed and matched. But we are here, we have Johnson & Johnson, we have, um, which is a single dose vector, and we have the mRNAs, which is the Pfizer, the Moderna. And we haven't seen studies of combining Moderna and Pfizer. We've only seen the viral vector and the mRNAs, so. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. That's, that's really my two big questions I wanted to ask today. And uh, now I'll throw it open to the floor, whether anyone has uh, any uh, questions. Are there any uh, questions on the chat? I think there's some questions on the chat. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions is, will hybrid immunity increase the ADA risk of the future COVID mutation? Okay. So I am going to tell you that... Uh, I believe that there are many people who've had the infection at an asymptomatic level before the variants of concern became available, at least from where I am. I don't know worldwide. And many of those asymptomatic individuals got the in, uh, immunization. And I don't see any concern related to ADE at all. I do think that this is a non-issue. I just brought it up today because it's a question that's asked of me and I was being proactive about discussing it. But I do believe that there are many people who are hybrid immune because they did not, they're not aware or maybe they're aware that they had prior infection and we are not seeing that. So I am not worried about it at all. Thank you, Monica. Um, are there any, any more questions on the chat? Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Chong, yes. Can I have? Um, yes. Dr. Sajat, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Chan. Uh, 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 I think uh, it was a very good presentation, uh, Dr. Monica, and very, uh, I mean, very informative for me, uh, I can say. Uh, so I have uh, two, three questions. 
and thank you very much, Chong. You have asked one of my questions, uh, which was uh, the mixing of the vaccine. So I have also uh, had the Sinovac. In Pakistan, we have mostly the Sinovac and the Sinopharm. I have a Sinopharm. So I just would like to know whether uh, 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 I can have the mixed vaccine uh, to which back vaccine, either Pfizer, Madonna, or which will be the most effective for the people who have the Sinopharm or Sinovac, number one. Uh, my, my second question is, uh, what duration, uh, what will be the exact duration between the first and the second dose? Because sometimes uh, uh, the government uh, uh, directed the people that the second dose will be done after four weeks. Sometimes they announced the after six weeks. What is the actual uh, duration? If anybody have the uh, 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 longer duration, is the uh, effect in the efficacy of the vaccine or before or the duration, if the duration is short. So the, what will be the effect of uh, doing this, the shorter the duration or the longer the duration. So number, the last one is my request to the CIMO on the CIMO platform that the acceptance of the vaccine, which is very important, the, the, the countries are not accepting the vaccines, uh, some of the vaccine, which is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, given in, in, in their uh, respective uh, countries. So uh, I have on behalf of the Secretary General Pakistan Medical Association, I have written a letter to the Dr. Ross, Director General of the WHO, and I have requested him to uh, to just direct the, all the countries to have uh, 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 that the WHO, what the WHO has accepted those vaccines and vaccines should be accepted to every uh, country all over the world. So uh, 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 my request to Simao uh, platform that the Simao on Simao platform the, uh, should request the WHO to accept all those uh, vaccines who uh, accepted by the WHO so that vaccine should be accepted to all over the world. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Monica? Sure. Okay. So the two questions that were directed to me were you received the Sinopharm or the Sinovac um, and what the next vaccine should be. And the second question was regarding time interval between doses. So the Sinovac and the Sinopharm vaccines are the inactivated vaccines and they represent the same family of, of um, vaccines. So that means that any other vaccine that's available will work by a different mechanism whether that be Moderna, whether that may be Pfizer. It just so happens that there's a lot of trials and a lot of data related to Moderna and Pfizer. That's why we talk about it a lot. There's a lot of data about AstraZeneca and AstraZeneca is kind of the model for the viral vector. So in your case, you can receive any of the other of the other two vaccines and it would probably be effective. Now, having said that, that's just my opinion based on what we have seen and what we're extrapolating from prior data. What is better is if we see data to say, you know what, we had this X number of people who received Sinovac uh, and then they received another vaccine and they were able to demonstrate immune responses. So what I am saying is a blanket statement and is an extrapolation. And I do suspect that at this point, like I've said before, the availability of vaccine is more important than the choice of the vaccine. That statement is also true for timing and interval. The studies have done either been three weeks or they've been four weeks for the Moderna. The majority of these trials have been three weeks. But they have also shown in early data from Israel that if they increase the time duration, that they would stretch out the two doses. That's why in Canada, they were very readily stretching out the dose to 16 weeks so that more people could get the first dose um, and so that they could make it available. I don't know if we have the right answer as to what is the perfect time interval. I would say that it's always best to follow the science and to say that if a study was done, and that's why in the United States, Fauci consistently said, we are not changing the time interval because the studies were done with that time interval. 
even though it may not affect efficacy, it might change the side effect profile too. We don't know, okay? When the vaccine is available, whatever is available, just utilize that one then. Okay, Monica, uh, uh, can I have, uh, actually uh, it's happening, the shortage of uh, duration is happening also in the Canada. My son is there in Toronto. Uh, okay. He had a first dose of uh, a Pfizer vaccine and he was advised to come after four months for the yes. second dose. But suddenly, suddenly he received and he, he just got message that he can have the vaccine, uh, the second yes. dose, uh, even after four weeks. So yes. what is this? This is uh, the, uh, the uh, suddenly they just shortage the duration. Yes, because they ended up getting a shipment. So the reason okay. that they increased the interval was because they weren't sure that the shipment was coming. There was a manufacturing delay, I believe, um, and that's why they didn't. And when the vaccination was then procured, they then made it available to everybody. And that's why when I showed the world map, you could see that Canada was dark blue. And once it's available, just get it. It doesn't matter if it's four weeks, six weeks, six, two months, when it becomes available, they can get it. Dr. Joshi, I saw your hand was yeah, put yes. up. I will answer. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. Joshi, uh, can I have, ask a question, please? Uh, can we let Dr. Joshi uh, uh, answer, uh, ask the question first? I'll come yes, to you, yes, Charlie. Yeah. Monica, great talk. And uh, I think uh, you, know, you made two very valid points. One is the mix and match. And second is the availability of vaccines. Any personal preference on the platform of sequencing? That's the first thing. Because if you have two Pfizer's, like in India, most of us have got two COVID shields as healthcare professionals. And uh, now we have Covaxin, which is available. So, and also the second question is, uh, does data on variant of concern uh, actually determine the choice of boosters? Because some vaccines have better data on variants of concern, like a Pfizer, a Moderna, or a Covaxin compared to the other vaccines. And the third, uh, you know, thing is that some data on vaccines is done at the peak of the pandemic. Some data of the vaccines is published when the vaccine, the pandemic was at very low in that country. So when you're interpreting data on efficacy, you have to see whether, you know, and none of these disclosed that this was done when there was no peak and this was done when there was peak. So how do you look at all this? Thanks once again for a fantastic talk. Oh. Thank you so much for your feedback. And I also wanted to pause and just to say thank you to all of you who've come today to listen to this talk. Um, I know that we're all extremely busy and we're all have Zoom fatigue. And for all of you to be here um, it really means um, a lot to me. Okay. Now to answer your questions, Dr. Joshi. So when I was presenting the data, I was talking about preprint data and those that were peer reviewed. I talked about the dates of the publications and I talked about the dates that the patients were enrolled in the studies. By the time that these the data is revealed, um, I believe that the variant has mutated already. So I think that by the time any data is collected, analyzed, written, um, peer, uh, it's been reviewed by all the authors and posted with the diagrams, the, 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 the data is already not uh, applicable to today's scenario. Um, and so that is the hard thing. And that was the problem with the mm -hmm. Madeira and the Pfizer is that those data was revealed at a time when variants of concern was not, it was, I think, pre-alpha. I think it was pre-alpha when that came out. But what you're seeing is now when you take the same vaccines to losing a, a Moderna and Pfizer in this example, is that there is efficacy against the variants of concern, that there is enough epitope recognition on the spike protein despite the vari variations that are happening that is producing antibodies. Now, does antibody recognition, antibody production prevent disease? That is something else to be seen. We saw a huge Delta variant surge in Delhi. We saw patients who had been received both doses of vaccination where the, um, where the coexistence of other comorbid factors really led to um, really a high level of mortality. Now, in terms of, for you, um, in terms of like in India, like what should we do? I, again, my philosophy in this scenario is pick a vaccine that utilizes a different mechanism of action. It doesn't matter which one it is. Um, my, my feeling is that this is going to become endemic and we are going to require immunizations frequently and looking at the different immune profile that we will build with time based on different vaccines, like how we receive the annual flu vaccine here, 
that we will then develop a very wide repertoire of memory B cells and T cell effector responses uh, to the vaccine. And I, I really think it's going to be an issue of lottery of what is available and did we get the right vaccine for the right virus? Maybe in Mumbai, one vaccine is better and Delhi's another va vaccine is gonna be better and we have no idea of knowing that. Um, I think India taught us a lot in the last couple of months. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there were very hard lessons to learn. Um, but um, I do believe that the fact that we have more vaccines coming out and again, looking at Novavax, I was very impressed with Novavax's data if it is so easy to distribute, if it's easy to make, if it's easy to store, and if it's easy to administer, I do believe that's one of the vaccines that will be out there as the next dose. Uh, Monica, uh, thank you very much. Hello. Dr. Salma, I'll let Dr. Elvin uh, ask the question first. He's been waiting for a while, then I'll come to you. Okay. Dr. Chong, I too would like to ask, please. Okay, uh, let's Elvin uh, ask the question first. Elvin? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Monica, for such an excellent presentation. We benefit so much from your talk. And uh, I, I'd just like to ask first uh, about the um, neutralizing antibody. And uh, well, in Hong Kong, one is Pfizer. And the antibody that were checked in the vaccine group have been 10 times of that of the uh, Sinovac uh, vaccinees, you know. So um, I, and our, our scientists would say that, well, don't worry, uh, although there's a lower level of antibodies, then we still have the lymphocyte, the uh, T cells, B cells, CD4 cells, et cetera. So it's still effective. So first question is, uh, Monica, so how can we measure these aspects of immunity of our vaccines, how can we know that the um, lymphocyte system is really working effectively with enough uh, strength to defend? Uh, or it's just a subjective hope that, oh, it should be there. Then how can we really guarantee? And um, so the second question is, so um, in Hong Kong, we have been, uh, uh, ongoing studies to uh, have the mixed uh, vaccination. Usually it's the first dose is a Sinovac with the less efficacy. So the second dose would be from Pfizer or BioNTech. So it's in fact a pull up, is a pull up. So uh, we would expect uh, a better efficacy with such a hybrid. Um, well, what about others uh, say, um, if the first one is uh, Pfizer, uh, I mean, uh, say, the, I have completed my two doses and the level was very high of the neutralizing antibody. But for the third booster dose in the future might be necessary, then in fact, we don't have another choice, only Sinovac. <laughs> so in fact, my suspicion is that if I have the third dose of a different mechanism, and that is Sinovac, which has a much lower efficacy, should I do that at all? Or should I have the third dose still with a BioNTech? Or if Hong Kong doesn't import any Novavax, so I don't have that choice or sputiness, uh, uh, all right? Just now the Russian uh, vaccine presented by you is so good, but we didn't have that. Uh, yeah. uh, so what do you uh, suggest in that case? Our third dose, what should we have? Sinovac with the lower efficacy, or still uh, Pfizer. And okay. uh, so about the ADE, so yeah. half of our population that had been vaccinated had received, uh, you know, Sinovac with such a low uh, efficacy. Would it really be more vulnerable for these vaccines in our immunity to have promote somehow the ADE? Um, I just want to ask this silly question. Uh, I, I could not ask this in Hong Kong, you know, because many of our citizens had got the Sinovac. If we raised these questions, they would be very scared and they would be um, angry with us, you know. Don't hurt our confidence, <laughs> they would uh, okay. suspect us. Okay. So you had quite a few great questions in there and I'm gonna to try to summarize all your questions in my answers. 
So the one question is, is how do we know how efficacious the different vaccines are? And to make a long story short, the best way you would know is by looking at those patients who are hospitalized and who are in the ICU and looking back to see what their vaccination status was. Were they vaccinated? Were they not vaccinated? Which vaccine did they get? If your ICU is all full of the Sinovac, you have your answer, right? What's more effective than the other? It doesn't matter what the antibody levels are. It doesn't matter anything. You're looking at the, ultimately, what are we looking for the antibodies for? Is we're looking to prevent disease, hospitalizations, ICU care, and death, right? So if you've already had populations that have been vaccinated, and then you go now and you look at your ICUs, and then you ask them what vaccinations they got, that is what you need to look at more than looking at the antibody levels. The second question is the Sinovac is not as effective as the Pfizer, and you've gotten two doses of the Pfizer, and should you get the Sinovac as a third, even if it's not as efficacious? Now, efficacy was defined by how effective it was six months ago, three months ago, right? It's not necessarily based on the virus that is, that is, um, that is circulating now. And when you've already had two doses of a virus, of a viral vaccine, you've already developed immunity. So by giving a booster dose, you're only recalling immunity that's gonna be much stronger. So you basically any vaccine, any vaccine would be good as long as it works different. So now the question is would a third great vaccine versus a third vaccine of a different mechanism be efficacious? I think that it would be great. And you have a study right there. Right, you can now generate your own study because you can look at populations that receive Pfizer, which is your healthcare professionals, the Sinovac, which is probably your community, and then you're looking at the third dose that they get of a different vaccine to see if the vaccine responses are by illness, by neutralizing antibodies, and you can publish the reports and let us know the answer to that question. Mm. Thank you, Monica. Dr. Thank Salma, you. Do you have a question for us? Dr. Salma. Dr. Salma, you have a question for us? I think you'll need to unmute. I'm so sorry. Thank you, Dr. Chang and Monica. It was a lovely, lovely talk. My question to you is that I know a few people who've had two doses of Sinopharm, but their antibody level is zilch. What they were asking me is, should they get a third shot and should it be from another company? Uh, sorry, another like Astro or Pfizer or whatever, which is available in Pakistan. My second question is that as time passes, most of the viruses become less virulent, less pathogenic. That is the nature of, that is the law of nature. But over here we see, we see that it is becoming, with mutation, it is becoming more bad. What is the reason? The third question is, the third question, no, it is a request to all of you, Please do tell the WHO, whichever vaccine is accepted, all the countries should open their borders for that because it doesn't make sense. I've been vaccinated by Sinopharm. Why should, and if my antibody level is good, why should I get a third vaccine? Why should I deprive somebody else from a vaccine and get it for myself because I want to travel to the US or UK or Germany or anything? Please do work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sama. Monica? Yes. Yeah. Great question. So two doses of a vaccine and no antibodies, and we're saying that there are cellular responses that are present. Should I get the next third dose? So the answer is yes, but I'm going to say to wait. I am going to say wait and let's see what the new booster, the booster doses are going to be. I know that there are trials right now looking at new doses. I don't want that you get a third dose of something and then you're afraid to get the fourth dose because that got approved in October for the next series of the upgraded boosters. So I would prefer that if you've gotten two doses of the vaccine, you've got the benefit of the vaccine that you've had right now, and then wait till the fall when the new vaccine uh, round is gonna go and it's going to be uh, from a different mechanism. That would be my recommendation based on what I'm seeing. But I do think that it's up to a lot of different factors. Maybe if your um, questions are coming from people who have access to the vaccine, they really feel that they're high risk. 
They really want antibodies, but I really discourage the measuring of antibodies to assess immune responses because it is really just one small part of the picture. And I think that's really hard to know because everybody wants to have a oh. test, have some sort of reassurance. We know people who have had antibodies in the past and people who've not had antibodies who've been fine. So I hope that answered your questions. Nice to Thank meet you. you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sama. Thank you, Monica. How about Ravi? Ravi, you have a question for us? Yes, Dr. Monica. Anyway, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I know it's very late for you back in the U.S. But uh, my question is, okay, now, uh, we are still not aware when a booster dose is supposed to be taken. Or like, you know, the flu virus where we have been advised once a year. Uh, what is the recommendation at the moment for this? So I didn't present it, but there was data that came out that they said that the con concomitant administration of the flu vaccine and the COVID vaccine is safe. Um, I do believe that there will be something that will come out this fall, and I do believe that um, it'll be. I just don't have enough. I mean, I was just looking at the mix and match data that was coming out and the Novavax data that came out uh, this week. So I feel like I said, like every day we could be doing a presentation on vaccines because there's new data that's coming out and there's so much information to review you really don't know what is representative in terms of how it'll change the way you approach vaccines. But I do think that if you got your two doses, sit tight, let's wait to see. There's gonna be more data coming out. I'm waiting for more peer reviewed publications. A lot of this is non, this is preprint data or non peer reviewed data that's been, um, that, I, that I quoted today. Thank you, Monica. There was a Dr. Chandra that, that asked the question. I had a, had a wave, Sarah. Um, Dr. Dr. Chong, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Chong. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monica. Thank you. Actually, just uh, to be precise, uh, just uh, uh, in, in Bangladesh, there was a just study in the slum areas. Actually, you know, the people. Uh, so they, they have done, conducted a search there and uh, uh, they have uh, just measured the antibodies and they got it this uh, more, more than 70% of the slum dwellers actually they have antibodies already, but they do not have the disease. It's almost asymptomatic. So can we just, uh, they have not done the neutralizing antibody test. So can we just suggest that they can defer their vaccination uh, when, when there is a scarcity of vaccines? Number one. Number two, you have just uh, we have just uh, seen in Israel that myocarditis have developed in young people, and uh, the Pfizer actually didn't uh, actually acknowledge that, and they said that it needs more research on that. What what is the latest about the myocarditis development? This two things. Thank you. The myocarditis, myocarditis, uh, regarding the Pfizer vaccine. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that was kind of found at 16, I think it was like 16 to 20, 16 to 21, 16 to 18 age group, mostly yeah. in boys. They found the myocarditis to be very mild. Um, it was treated with like NSAID use. Um, and um, I haven't heard much more beyond that uh, related to the myocarditis. I personally have not seen any patients with that side effect, nor have I heard of any of my colleagues um, who've experienced that side effect, but we are looking out for it as well. And we are counseling patients about this, but um, so far I have not seen that. Um, regarding the first scenario that you were talking about, uh, uh, whether or not they should get the vaccine, can you explain that scenario again to me? What, why yeah, did they yeah. want Yes, please. Can you? Uh, can you from what I understand, you? Monica, uh, from what Dr. Chowdhury said was that the slum dwellers had uh, raised, uh, had antibodies to uh, COVID but they denied ever having, they, they were obviously asymptomatic infections. Yeah. And uh, he, he was asking whether uh, they can be so like placed later on for the vaccine, oh, sure. Uh, sure. The vaccine yeah. queue because of necessity. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so when it comes to vaccine distribution, um, there was a lot of information at the beginning of the pandemic related to those who had prior infections or demonstrable antibodies to say that they should not be on the top of the list. I don't think that the top of the list, bottom of the list in this scenario is dependent on the presence of antibodies because this person is likely to be high risk for reinfection based on where they live, right? So 
we are not assuming that all the antibodies that this person has is going to be necessarily protective because again, we don't always necessarily know if antibody levels is equivalent to pre prevention of disease. It might be in most cases, but we don't know um, how well um, that this is correlated. If the patient is at low risk for infection, you don't have community spread, he's in a safe area, fine, wait, wait on vaccination and you need to redistribute. You have definitely have your first tier immunizations, which is your, your healthcare workers, your first responders. But then when it comes to communities, then you might think of prioritizing the elderly. So that prioritization helps occurs on a community level. Every, every community will choose their own priority list. And if you think that the risk of infection is okay or it's low, that slum did not have a lot of infections, then yes, you can, you can put this person lower on the priority list. But if that slum is having a surge, it doesn't matter if he has antibodies, he should still get the vaccination because then he should benefit from hybrid immunity. And that's what I was showing is that these patients can develop the benefit even more than anybody else. So then they should definitely um, get vaccinated. These are very Dr. difficult Dr. questions. Dr. Pillai here, can I ask yes. a question? Yes, yes Dr. Pillai. Dr. Pillai. Yeah, see, uh, epidemiologically speaking, herd immunity, if 60% of the population have immunity, then there's herd immunity. Will that uh, modify our vaccine policy, whether we should uh, vaccinate or eligible people, say, above 14 years, or uh, take into consideration herd immunity, if 60% of the population has antibodies or immunity, then uh, there's no need for the disease can get controlled. Second, of course, is uh, uh, rather than booster dose, are we going to have a situation where every year you are going to have a vaccine? against COVID because variants or uh, mutations can happen, just like influenza virus where mutations are there and every year a new vaccine you are taking uh, to prevent infection. So yearly uh, booster dose, whether we are going to that stage, so thank you. So that's a great um, comment regarding herd immunity. Um, herd immunity, the number is dependent on the r naught. The R naught uh, for each variant is different. Um, so I think the herd immunity uh, definition is a moving target. So that's just my comment about herd immunity. In terms of uh, the pandemic becoming endemic requiring annual boosters, um, I do feel that there will be a booster this fall. Um, and after that, we just have to wait and see, just like Dr. Salma had said, that in the natural history of pandemics and viruses, these viruses will mutate to normally become um, weaker, but we are seeing an unusual display of, 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 of the virulence of, of these um, mutations. And I think that it's still running its course before it will eventually then mix in with um, our regular coronaviruses. So some, Dr. Salma, again, I probably, I forgot to answer that question for you earlier. I don't know what makes this different. This is we have never seen anything like this before. And um, I'm not a virologist, so um, I'm sure maybe a virologist might be able to answer that. Thank so you. I think, so I think we are almost at the end. Uh, we will ask a couple of questions from the chat box. Uh, I see a lot of people are joining from the other uh, forum. We have a round table next. And uh, I think Shashank Joshi is, is taking that session on uh, a very important topic. So one of the questions which is there in the chat box is, uh, for those who are not responding on COVID-19 vaccine, is it wise to consider ivermectin pro, uh, prophylaxis given the Goa experience? Um, I am going to say that again, the vaccine responsiveness is difficult to assess with the tools that we have. If you have a certain vaccine in an area and you're seeing a lot of breakthrough infections, hospitalization rates, and you know that the vaccine's not effective, but if your vaccine antibody levels are not detectable, I will not define that you are high risk by that um, unless you feel that in that area that the, um, the rate is very high. Um, I cannot comment on ivermectin. I don't have any personal experience with ivermectin. It is not approved in the United States for both prophylaxis or treatment. Um, and so um, I, I cannot answer that question. I do believe that we do not know a lot of things about a lot of medications 
and that there is probably an answer out there. We just don't know it, but I, I don't know how to answer. Thank, Thank you. you, Monica. Thank you very much. And I think uh, because the next chat is, the next group is coming in already. So I'm afraid we have to call it a day today. Uh, and it was a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Really, really informative. I think brought out a lot of uh, very important issues for all of us. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's uh, meeting and especially uh, some of my colleagues that have just uh, come tuned in from Singapore. Thank you for coming to join us as well. And, uh, you know, we are also happy that uh, Monica gave us a, such a brilliant um, uh, presentation, which I thought was very, very useful. And in, yes. especially for Singapore right now, it's very pertinent for us as well. And for quite, a, uh, I think for quite a number of countries, quite pertinent that we need to get on with it. You know what I mean? Uh, find the light at the end of the tunnel. So without much ado, thank you all for coming. And, you know, we thank always you. look forward thank you. to um, uh, next week's um, uh, chat again. Uh, and we have, uh, I will announce the next week's speaker. I think since we already have a lot of people still with us, uh, I would like the, it's the same platform, same uh, uh, meeting ID. Everything remains the same. This is a weekly meeting. Every Saturday we conduct at the same timing at 9.30 Indian time, which is one and a half hours before this time. Uh, the next week topic, we have Dr. Shashank Joshi with us, and he's taking a topic on home isolation uh, during COVID. And also he will cover about the third wave and Delta variant. Uh, that's again uh, one of the very important because he has been a very instrumental in Mumbai task force. He's, he's, he works very closely with the government. So he had a lot of data to present. Uh, we will have Dr. Shashank Joshi next week. So I request everyone who is a, whoever is here can join this meeting next week, uh, same time, uh, same day, and same meeting ID. We don't change okay. meeting IDs. With so uh, now we will end this meeting. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chong, for helping me out, for bringing uh, participants. Thank you, Dr. Monica, for uh, coming you. up with an excellent topic. I believe one day we will only have to have a question answers round because uh, the questions doesn't stop. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Uh, people can stay back. If